first of all, I have to thank both of you for sharing your story with everyone tonight, sharing it with us, sharing it with this chamber, sharing it with the community, your friends, your family, your colleagues. Uh, you know, they say the word unprecedented and, and your story is certainly that. And we are just, I mean, Robin and I have already expressed this, but you know, in other meetings with you, but I just want everyone to know, I can't begin to tell you how grateful we are. And I know you know this, all of you out there, um, how grateful we are to Karen and Sandra for, for, for doing this tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, we, are, we do have a series of questions that we discussed with Karen and Sandra and they, they created, they're in a chronological order. So there's no discussion about what happened when and where and how and why. Um, and I wanna thank our sponsors. We have a, what they call a series uh, called The Power of Women at the Greater Beverly Chamber of Commerce of which I am the director, Leslie Gould, so thank you. And our co-host as and co-host with Robin Foster who's the assistant director this evening. Um, it's called the Power of Women series, and this is part of the Power of Women series, but we obviously opened it up to everyone so that everyone can embrace this and be a part of uh, this inspirational story this evening. So I want to first just thank the sponsors for Power of Women, and they are our gold sponsor is Eastern Bank. Uh, our silver sponsors are Brookline Bank, Robin Martin at Churchill Properties. She's a realtor there. Constitution Financial Partners. Jill Michaud, Gibson Sotheby International Realty. She's a real estate agent with them. Our bronze sponsor for the series is Beverly Bootstraps, the thrift store. And Estelle Rand, who is a Beverly Ward city councilor uh, from Beverly. We really appreciate that. But we also have event sponsors just for tonight, just just to support Karen and to celebrate Karen and, and this event with this community. So we really appreciate you stepping up and uh, they are our sponsors, our silver sponsors are Anthony and Dodge, certified public accountants. Uh, we have the Keller Williams Realty team of Sarah McBurney Laporto and Linda Turcott. Uh, Temkin Financial Group, LLC. We love Al, of course, we love them all. Uh, and our bronze event sponsors for this evening are uh, Super Sub Casual Catering and Russell, the Russell Center for Chiropractic Care. And we are very, very grateful. We also want to just mention that we do have, not that this is a political event because it isn't. However, we have some dear friends um, from our elected officials. We have uh, Mayor Safathia Rome Romeo Tenkin. I don't know if she's out there, but hello, hello, hello. Uh, Mayor Bill Scanlon, former Mayor, Mayor Scanlon from Beverly, hello, hello, and Senator Joan Lovely. So thank you so much for joining us, all of you. We truly, truly appreciate it. And it just, quite frankly, Karen and Sandra goes to the heart and soul of how many people's lives you've touched. We've had over 450 people RSVP for this event tonight, so we hope we don't blow up the internet, or maybe we do. Um, <laughs> please roll with us on any technical issues that come up. Uh, and want to make sure that ooh, that we are recording, of course. I don't know if, I think you I, have to I, record it, Robin. Are you recording it? I hit okay. record. Yep. Thank you. So glad because that's right. You're the host. I'm not. Um, and that's and that's really it. And then what we wanted to do was just throw it over to Karen and to Sandra to do some, some just say a few words before we actually start and get into the questions. So Karen, lead us off, if you will, please. And thank hey. you again. We are so grateful. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you for inviting us to tell our incredible story. And thank you to the Great, Greater Beverly Chamber of Commerce. You guys have always been there for me. So I'm, and I'm, I want to thank the sponsors because obviously this is a tough year for the chamber. Um, you know, I, we hosted one of the biggest events, right? And we're not doing that. I know you're getting more creative with it, but we need to keep you guys financially supported so you're around next year for all of us. Um, I do want to give a shout out to Sherry Russell from the Russell Center for Chiropractic and Sports Medicine because today is her birthday as is Jackie Rapisardi, our NSMT house manager, and Susan Weeks, our board member. So happy birthday to all of them. And I want to thank everyone. I know that donations have already come in for the Stephen Richard Memorial Photography Scholarship. I want to thank you, um, thank them and Nate Bertoni for starting that. And the announcement with regards to that tonight is one of the recipients in a big way of that scholarship is going to be one of our chamber members, Montserrat College of Art. So. We'll be talking to them in the next few weeks about what that's going to look like for both of us. And, um, and that's it, basically, Sandy. 
I just want to thank everybody for allowing us to be here with you tonight. I want to thank the Greater Beverly Chamber of Commerce for inviting us this evening. And, and uh, I look forward to the next hour with you all. And I should say, you're going to hear from Sandra a lot tonight because there is a big chunk of my life in the past few months where I was asleep. So I think it's going to be fascinating for you to hear from her what I was experiencing it at the time because I actually don't remember experiencing a lot of it. So you will hear a lot from her. And thank you so much, both of you. We really appreciate it. I just want to remind everyone, we did put the uh, scholarship donation in the chat at the top of the chat, but I'm just going to um, reiterate it just in case if you just happen to have a pen, pencil. It is called the Stephen, S-T-E-V-E-N, Stephen Richard Scholarship. And it's care, you should send a donation should you like to, uh, care of Nate, N-A-T-E, Bertone, Bertone, right? B-E-R-T. T-O-N-E, 14 Crescent Drive in Salem, and that's 01970. Again, it is in um, the chat, and if you want to, certainly, if, if for some reason you didn't get that, you can always email us here at the chamber at info at greaterbeverlychamber.com. And again, this is recording this evening, so um, for those who couldn't attend or if you want to watch it again. Um, can I say something? Yes, Leslie, Robin, absolutely. Um, I just want to... Um, repeat what I said before. If you want to see whoever's speaking bigger than everybody else, just go up and click on speaker view. Okay. Thank you, Robin. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, okay. So our first question this evening, because let's just get right to it. So this is, it's like I was saying to Robin and to Karen and Sandra the other day, this is the biggest event I've, we have ever done. I've personally ever done it in my 20 years at at, as a chamber director. Um, and, and that's incredible. Karen, what are your thoughts about that? Just think about, you know, knowing that four, 450 people are mm -hmm. repeat for this event. I mean, I'm pretty humbled, obviously. Um, it is an interest. It's a, I think it's a story that gave so many people hope during a really tough time. And, um, you know, on this call, I have lifelong friends of mine, lifelong friends of Stevens, his siblings are on it. Um, my siblings are on it, his cousins, um, friends, family, from, from birth to current day colleagues, business colleagues. So um, I'm just really humbled, honestly, by the support, not only tonight, by, but by what I've received over the past several months. And oh, go ahead. so, and just, I mean, I think the timing felt right. I mean, maybe today I wasn't so sure the timing was right, that I was ready, but um, when I said yes, I thought the timing was right. I think if we had done it or any earlier, it would have been very difficult. Um, you know, I'm a former president and board member of this chamber and it's, you know, it's my favorite chamber. Uh, there are so many people in this chamber that I'm close to and um, some of my closest friends and business colleagues belong to this chamber. And of course, don't forget two of my best friends, Leslie and Robin. <laughs> but this, you know, this- Who are your best, best friends? We were laughing about that. Which one is better? Day. Which is your best <laughs> friend? <laughs> well, you've been here for 22 year, years, Robin, so I'm yeah. gonna say. That's yeah, and, but I mean, I go back, when I was at the radio station, I mean, I go back to 1990 with this chamber. So I have a lot of history. It's, an, it's incredible. You had, ha, you've had so many opportunities, uh, Karen, for interviews, and you sort of already touched on it, but why, why the Greater Beverly Chamber? I mean, you could go to, you, you are, just through your business, you know, connections. Yeah. There are so many organizations. I mean, I, I always say, like, you're a pillar of this community. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you're a mover and a shaker, and you make things happen. Why, why the Greater Beverly Chamber? You know, I mean, I, I actually was supposed, I turned down an interview with CNBC and um, Maria Menounos wants to interview me and I put that off until now. I just, I kind of wanted to give you guys the first untold story because um, the people behind this tonight are all the people who I care the most about in the community, quite frankly. It's awesome. And this chamber has always been there for me. Thank you, Karen. Sandra, Sandra, I have a question for you. Yes. Your Facebook posts were so eloquent and quite frankly, a lifeline to all of us in the community. At what point did you decide to go public on Facebook and did you have any regrets about your decision to do so? Um, Karen and Stephen went into the hospital on Tuesday. By Friday, 
we were hearing um, so many rumbling, rumblings from various people that uh, they're in a coma, that they're near death. Uh, it, it was horrific, the information that was out there. So I had spoken with Karen briefly on that Thursday, Friday. Um, I spoke with my own sisters, our sisters, Anna Maria and Gina uh, and Doreen, Stephen's sister, uh, to just talk about what's the right thing to do here. Um, we had some open and honest dialogue. It went back and forth. Uh, you know, Karen and Stephen are so well known, known in the North Shore. Uh, and as uh, you all know, Karen has 3,000 closest friends. That's the <laughs> truth. Uh, so managing that was something. We All we knew was that we had to control the narrative and make sure that the right information got out there. Um, and, and so we just all thought it was the right thing to do. With regrets, none. Uh, the support that we received from the community throughout this, the prayers and the mantras and the cards and the positive thoughts uh, and so much more, the songs, the songs, uh, yeah. It was a gift to us. Uh, the community was a source of inspiration for our entire family. So no, no regrets. And we're glad that we did it. We this it poor girl, could you imagine managing my posse? Like, unbelievable. Well, that's my you next did question. An incredible job. Incredible my next job. question is, you probably couldn't have dreamed that this was going to go on for 65 days. No. <laughs> so how in the world did you manage your sister's care, keeping all of us informed, all while working full time? Um, I, I'm very fortunate to have great supports. My husband, Bill, my children, my, our sisters, Anna Maria and Gina, um, Stephen's sister, Doreen, and his brother, Glenn, were incredible. They never wavered in their support throughout this whole thing. Uh, the support I received from my coworkers, I work with four incredible women at the Haverhill Public Schools, and I would not have made it through them, uh, through this without them. Our superintendent of schools, I have to give a shout out to her, Dr. Margaret Murata. Uh, she's extraordinary. Can you imagine her managing everything that was going on, any superintendent of school? Um, and, uh, and, and, and there wasn't a day that didn't go by where she wasn't reaching out and checking in and seeing how Karen was doing. So I was very fortunate um, to have a great support system. From day one, I kept a log. I think that kept me focused and organized um, on every communication that was critical. Um, and uh, and uh, I guess that's it. It was- She literally has a log. It's a spiral notebook. I can't bring myself to read it, but she has read it a lot to prep for different things that we've needed. And it says on the top of the page, day one, and she has every doctor she spoke to, everything that they said, everything that I said, in every drug I was given in such detail. Like I said, I, I can't look at it yet, but someday I will. Karen, thank you. You know, this journey has taken you, it took you from Winchester Hospital to Leahy Hospital and uh, Medical Center, to Spalding Rehab, and to Sandra's home. Can you take us back to Tuesday, March 17th, the day that you and Stephen went to Win Winchester Hospital? And, you know, there was so much going on that day, if you think about it, St. Patrick's Day, uh, Tom, mm -hmm. Brady's, Tom Brady's big announcement. And this day, this day was a day that changed your life. Yeah, I mean, we were sick for, I was sick for a couple of weeks, I think even before I got COVID. I was already really sick and you know, I was diagnosed with a sinus infection and which turned into a secondary virus. So I was already really sick and obviously open to, you know, receiving something like this. There, there was a lot of bad information in the community. We were not at the Biogen conference. A lot of people in Linfield work there. So a lot of times they would do the Biogen story and then our story because we were on channel five and seven and news, every newspaper. And so um, people thought Stephen was shooting the Biogen conference which he was not. People thought we got it in Italy. I wish we were in Italy, you know, uh, no. Uh, people, because we had been at Chianti and uh, Don Kelly had been at Chianti, they thought that maybe both of us had gotten it there. That was not true. Both of, I can't speak to Don, but I know I was already sick before that because I mean, I saw Medley and Lauren that night. Thank God I didn't, I said to them, I'm, I'm just not feeling right. Don't touch me, don't hug me. Um, you know, I said, just kind of keep a distance. and. You know, so many people that week uh, that I knew and was working closely with, you know, had fevers and would call their doctor in a panic that they had cor coronavirus, we were calling it then. And, um, and the doctors would just say, you don't have corona, you know, relax, you'll be fine. 
I mean, I went to an urgent care where I was diagnosed with a sinus infection and a secondary virus. Stephen had a telephone conference with his doctor who was very lackadaisical about it and said, I think you just have a sinus infection too. So, you know, I, I catch myself saying, you know, that the medical community failed us, but they were flying by the seat of their pants. They had no idea. We were so early on, they had no idea. Um, and we're out every night of the week, you know, God only knows where we got it. But um, so over that weekend before St. Patrick's Day, we really got sick. I think both of us were oxygen deprived and not thinking clearly. People were begging us to go to the hospital. Stephen was refusing to go to the hospital because we thought we just had, you know, whatever. And so I finally, he got really bad on Tuesday and I said, I'm going to call an ambulance. And he said, no, drive me. So here I am delirious myself driving him to Winchester. And we live in Linfield, so that's his parents would always go to Winchester. So we went to Winchester, but we had to call ahead. You know, I called my doctor and she said, you can't just show up. It was so, they, she said, we have a staging area with tents in the emergency bay and just pull up to the emergency bay and wait in your car. And so that's what we did. And I called them when we arrived and they came out very quickly to get Stephen because I told them he was just gravely ill. And, you know, this is, one of the saddest moments for me, um, but one of the happiest things that I later found out, um, because when I, I got taken into the hospital four hours later, I sat in my car and I, I just remember my back killing me and I was so sick. And I w walked into the hospital and the blinds were closed in Stephen's room and they brought me in and they said, you know, your husband is very, very sick. And I, I knew it. And, um, and I didn't remember ever saying goodbye to him. And there's an amazing story um, about when Sandy actually went to get his belongings, um, our, both of our belongings, a, a PA from Winchester came up to her and she said, I have to share a story with you. And she said, the day that you're, I'm the person who took your brother-in-law out of the car. And she said, I will never, and she broke up in tears and she said, I'll never forget this. He got out of the car and he turned around and he looked at his wife and he just, blew her kiss and said, I love you. And she, and I was like a, and then I remembered it. As soon as she told me this story, I was like a schoolgirl, like, because I thought he was just being taken away. And he turned around so lovingly. And I went, well, I love you too, like, and touched my heart. And that was the last time I saw him. So, um, yeah, that was, that was the day, my, my last day. That was the day we entered the hospital and it was total chaos. It was a, it was like a MASH setup, like the TV show MASH. There were, just tents everywhere. And it was like, we were in some random part of the hospital, like a hallway that had been turned into a sick bay. And there were just so many sick people everywhere. It was, it was pretty frightening. And the, this might actually touch to what you just mentioned, you know, in the first week at Winchester, when life outside was changing for everyone and the COVID outbreak was so new to all of us, you know, what was actually happening in Winchester with you and Steven? I mean, Sandy, Sandy will speak to it because I was literally hallucinating in that point. I had a rare form of COVID that I had these horrific hallucinations that we can get into a little bit later. Um, but um, so what, what, the one thing I will say, because and then I want you to take over, is that someone should have taken my telephone away from me. I was texting people. Robin, I know I was texting you, but the, it, the word got out in the community that Stephen and I were admitted to the hospital and people were going crazy. So I was talking to the random, most random people on my cell phone. And I honestly wish someone had taken it away, but I guess you said legally they, they couldn't. We tried. Um, <laughs> we did. We did because we were finding out that she was texting 24-7. So Karen... So I apologize for the people I texted <laughs> at three o'clock in the morning, especially the bad information. So on day one, on Tuesday the 17th, Stephen was brought to the ICU immediately. And within hours, they sedated him because he was so bad. Karen was in a private room on oxygen. She was allowed to walk around the room with the oxygen on her. And then the next day they elevated her room because she needed more equipment to help her. But she was still receiving calls, taking calls. She was on the phone 24 seven. Uh, side note, legally you can't take a phone away from an adult, found that out, that should change. Um, she was receiving in all of this, all of Stephen's information from the doctor. She was his healthcare proxy. So she was trying to manage that also. So it was, it was a bit crazy uh, for her. On Friday, Stephen's health declined and they med flighted him to Leahy. 
um, hospital. Uh, the med flight was an ambulance. A lot of times people think that's a helicopter, but it's an ambulance and uh, it's like a hospital room with nurses in it. Um, Friday night, Karen was moved to the ICU uh, and they had been trying to get her in the ICU since Tuesday. Um, but so Stephen went to Leahy, Karen went to the ICU in Winchester. What we realized was that Stephen's bed is, was Karen's bed. And when Stephen left and was transferred to um, Leahy, Karen then was able to have a bed. And it was the first of two times, and we'll, we'll tell you about the second. It was that he gave up a bed for me so I could go to the next level of care. Sandra, the last time you spoke with Karen was on March 21st, moments before she was sedated. And the next time you would speak to her was on April 10th. What was happening in those three weeks? Uh, medically for Karen, uh, her breathing was very labored. Um, on Saturday, she was intubated, she was sedated, she was given a central line, uh, and she was in her neck, and she was given a feeding tube in her stomach. Um, she was very slowly declining. Uh, the amount of meds increased every day. They are trying different antibiotics, different pain meds. Uh, They're trying different drug cocktails with her. I mean, they would say to Sandra, what we just learned this week from Italy was these yeah. people were flying by the seat of their pants. Yeah, yeah. We just really wanted to get her to Leahy. We, we couldn't, there was no beds available for her. Um, as you know, that following Tuesday, Stephen had passed away. Um, and the next morning we received the call and Karen was med flighted to Leahy in the ICU. Um, Winchester and Leahy, just a side note, they are affiliated with each other and they have a really great um, relationship, obviously. So the transition from Winchester to Leahy um, was seamless. And it's just because Leahy has additional services that Winchester can offer. Uh, but they're two really great hospitals and the teams actually work in both hospitals. Um, in that time frame, I would get a call every day from the doctor or from the PA. Um, it started coming later and later. A lot of people were always asking, you know, where's the update? Um, and they were really coming late in the afternoon, late at night, um, instead of earlier in the day. But every time the structure was kind of the same, they would introduce themselves, they would confirm who I was. Um, they would ask me the details of the last notification I got. What, what do I know? And so that's where the notebook came in very handy. Um, and then they would speak and every single time they updated me on Karen, they always started with Karen is very sick. You have to know Karen is very sick. And then I would receive my update. Um, after every update, I would log it in my book. I would research it as my sister Anna Maria would say, do the Google and I did. Uh, so I could get, to, so I would get familiar with what was happening to her. I would research anything I could on anything that they told me. I, I would share the information immediately with Anna Maria and Gina. I would let Doreen and Glenn know, Stephen's siblings. Uh, and then the rest of the group um, um, would know. Um, it, in those weeks, uh, Karen, as only Karen could, uh, was fighting the sedation. They would walk in the room, she'd raise a hand, and she, it was just bizarre. And so it was at that time that they realized her body needed to rest, and so they put her in a uh, medically induced coma. Um, also happening in those weeks, which I think is really important to know in those three weeks, in addition to her medically was the support of the community. I, I've never seen anything like it, never. There were candles in the windows all over the North Shore and across the United States for everybody who knew her. Karen's dearest friend, Nate Bertoni, who I love and adore, started a postcard campaign. 200 people sent in postcards with well wishes for her. The North Shore Music Theater, the costume department started the mask campaign. Um, and I wanna say about Bill Haney, he contacted me every single day. He either called me or he texted me every day to check on his girl. He would say, how's my girl doing? But I also wanna thank Kevin Hill and Matthew and Matthew and Heather, who I love, and Dee Dee and Ricky. Uh, they were extraordinary, this North Shore team, and you have to know how great they were and how much they were looking out for her. Um, community coming together, the, the kids from A Christmas Carol, that brought tears to my eyes. They were having a Zoom meeting like this and they all sent Karen a well wish. There was people singing on social media. I, I listened to every single one. I cannot tell you during this difficult time, the support that we felt from all of you, our family felt from all of you. It was so important to us. And I know more importantly, it was felt by Karen. I just, you have to know that. One of the, uh, my friend Haley Swindle from New York, one of our actress friends, 
that she sent a video of all of these famous people singing to me. It was unbelievable. And one of them was Linda Etter, for those of you who know Linda Etter. And she, she sang a cappella, Moon River. I wish I could release it, but I would never. She, she was saying on it, you know, I'm, I'm a mess. I was riding with my, my hat on all day. And, and she said, I don't know what made me think to sing this song to you, um, but I chose it. And it's actually one of my all time favorite songs. Um, so, the, the, and I, I just want everyone to know that when I was in the hospital and when I came home, I have read every single comment on Facebook. Everyone's Stephen's best friends, my nieces, my nephews, my best friends, Sandy's updates, tens of thousands of comments, every single one of them I read personally because I wanted to know what I was missing during that time. Uh, another question for you, Sandra. I understand things tra changed drastically on Easter weekend. Mm. You spoke about a setback and a decline in her condition. Could you share more information about what happened that weekend, starting with the call to her? So on Good Friday, I received a call um, and they gave me my update on Karen and they were seeing signs of improvement. It was very encouraging, actually. Um, she had a little possible infection in their lungs that they were watching, but it was minor, they were saying, and they were just watching it closely. Um, they were encouraged on Good Friday that they were going to take her off of sedation. Um, and they um, um, thought for sure by then they were going to be able to wake her up. Um, they also shared with me that I was going to be able to speak with her, which got very exciting. Now she wouldn't be able to respond back because she was still sedated. <clears throat> and uh, they called me a short time later. The PA had an iPad. He passed it to the nurse. And, um, and I got to see her face for the first time. It really was just extraordinary. Is that what you sang to me? Yes. Um, and so, she sang to me. so I told Kieran during that two minutes that she was safe, that she was strong. I told her that she was surrounded by greatness and, and all who loved her. Um, and at that moment, she opened her eyes. And I told her that many people were sending her love and light and prayers. I asked her to take her time to heal. And uh, I told her that she will find her way back. I did sing to her. And I told her that Anna Maria and Gina and Doreen and Glenn love her. And I also told her, I swear to you, I told her that all of her family, including 3,000 of her closest friends, <laughs> and yes, I mentioned you all, were surrounding her and holding her up until she could uh, do it on her own. I was very grateful for that two minutes. <clears throat> and then later that night, about 11.45 at night, that Good Friday, I received a phone call. When that phone rang, I couldn't get to it fast enough because I knew they were going to tell me she woke up. I knew it. I knew and it was the only time in 65 days that I let my guard down. And I was ready and I was beaming with that call. And they told me that Karen took a turn for the worse and she was declining rapidly. And they continued the same on Saturday. And then on Sunday on Easter, my husband ran the phone up to me as I was getting ready for our Easter dinner with my kids. And uh, they told me that Karen's heart rate was out of control. It was not good. They had just given her the third medicine. She was on three different medicines for her heart and there was no change and that she's going to go into cardiac arrest and she's going to have a massive coronary and they couldn't do anything. They, she had the virus, she, coronavirus. She also started a second infection in the hospital that was in her lungs. And they said they could not open her up because then the other healthcare professionals would be at risk. And so at that time, <clears throat> I verbally gave the DNR for the heart issues uh, because there was nothing that they could do. And that was Sunday Easter. Um, yeah, this is a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. You know, before I get to the next question, I'm going to interject with something that I said actually to um, Robin, before all of this happened, it was right after our business awards dinner, which was a, a huge success back in uh, early February. And I remember saying to Robin, we are so lucky. This chamber is so lucky to have the North Shore Music Theater, the staff, everything that they do 
for us, for the community, but for this chamber to have a resource like that. I just wanted to give a shout out to everyone at the North Shore Music Theater. Um, Karen, everyone that you work with, I mean, their love through this for you, what they were posting on Instagram and LinkedIn and Facebook for you. You are, you obviously know this, but the, 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 the t-shirts and the mugs and I mean, just everything that they do, what an incredible resource. And I just had to interject before we go to the next question because you mentioned them and just they are they're just an incredible group of people so lucky to work with them and we're so lucky to have them in the community and I feel blessed to be able to know these people through this chamber the way that because because it's Beverly and you're in Beverly I mean mm-hmm. that's that's incredible so a big shout out to them absolutely okay, and I'll talk a little bit about helping. more later I'll tell a little bit more about the depths that they went to for me Excellent. No, and I appreciate that because we all want to hear it. Um, Obviously, Karen, you are with us today. Um, We all know the outcome. What was the turning point? So it was Tuesday morning. Um, Her heart was still crazy. Everything was still, but she was still hanging in there. Let there be no confusion. She's a warrior. Honestly, she is fierce and she is a warrior. I don't know how she survived it. Uh, Very early, very early Tuesday morning, I received a phone call and I never got on that early in the morning and it was a doctor and he asked if he could give her a blood transfusion and she checked all the boxes. She had a little bleeding internally. Um, Her oxygen levels were just so poor Um, and they talked about the risks. I approved it and they gave her the blood transfusion just um, just after six in the morning, I believe it was, within hours within hours of that blood transfusion, she started showing signs of improvement and she never looked back. Um, I have to recognize that Leahy team, uh, Leahy and Burlington, they are brilliant, they are sincere, they are patient, they are kind. Uh, Karen talked a little bit earlier about how they said, they're honest, you know, what we just learned from Italy, uh, from what we just found from our team meeting, uh, they worked very hard at saving her life and uh, I just, I can't thank them enough. But without a doubt in my mind, and I say this to anybody who asks me, without a doubt in my mind, um, that blood transfusion saved her life. I believe that was the turning point for everything. I also want to say about Leahy also, um, there was no surgeries going on in most hospitals because of this. Leahy brought in an anesthesiologist, uh, I think a handful of them, 24-7 in the ICU. And they had them there all the time because all the people in the ICU were intubated. I think that's a really important point for everybody to know that. And you want to, God forbid, anybody go and make, make sure they have one there. Because at one time, when people have COVID and they have the breathing, they have to flip. They call it proning. Sometimes you're on your back, they put you on your stomach. Then you go back on your back, then you're on your stomach. And you do that for several hours. And Karen did best when she was on her stomach. Well, one of the times when they put her back on her back, her breathing tube malfunctioned and they couldn't get it right. That anesthesiologist was steps away from her and he was able to switch it like that she wasn't getting oxygen there he was able to change it out just like that so bravo to Leahy for making that wise decision and making sure that an anesthesiologist is in the ICU um, at all times during this. I want to remind everyone too that this I mean obviously it's just such an incredible story when you're telling because I'm like riveted and it, it's a story of courage and resiliency and perseverance I mean Think of all the thousands of words that you could say about this story. Everyone's thinking of them right now. Everyone's got a word to describe what happened to you and how you made it through. And when you said she's a warrior, you are a thousand percent right. I mean, that, that absolute, she's never a doubt in my mind. Did I not think I said this to you the other day, Karen, I never thought that you would not make it. I always knew that you would put pull through because you're so strong. I mean, we should all have that will and strength within us. So you woke up, as, as you said, on day 35. That was Monday, April 20th. Can you share, Karen, a little bit more about that day or, or Sandra about that day? You should. Cause... So, so she was um, showing signs of improvement. Uh, everything was going in the right direction. All her numbers were going in the right direction. I received a call from her PA, Dan. Loved him, adored him. <laughs> um, and... I was completely shocked at what he said. He said, uh, Karen is awake. We have moved her to a chair. She couldn't move on her own, but they moved her to a chair. She is sitting up. She is on oxygen. She is delusional, which is not uncommon. Um, Her breathing tube is out. And uh, she was able to swallow her pills. That's shocking. 
it, it was shocking. It was, I don't remember this. It was way. crazy. Um, she was very delusional that whole time. It was a little crazy. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm just going to say she kept talking about a guy named Daryl in Gloucester. I don't know what that's all about. I was, to, she go, when I woke up, the doctor said to Sandy, who's Daryl from Gloucester? Who's Daryl from Gloucester? And so Sandy does her typical KK. When I woke up, she says, I got to ask you a question. <laughs> Is there something you want to tell me about Daryl from Gloucester? I'm like, who's Daryl from Gloucester? I call Lynn Parisi and John Orlando. I go, who's Daryl from Gloucester? They go, we have no idea. And honestly, during that whole time that week that, you know, after she woke up, I was so grateful. Karen's dearest friend in the whole world is Deb Mitchell, and she's a physician's assistant. And if it wasn't for her, I would have just been, she's losing it. I'll never get her back. Because honestly, you know, thinking physical, she wasn't able to walk. And then I'm thinking mentally, you know, what, what's going to happen for her. And, and uh, Deb told, shared a story that, you know, she thought she was in Tijuana for a week one time when she got out of it. So her situation, so it she grounded me and she made me realize live in the moment um, as I knew for this whole journey, just live in the moment. And, um, and uh, she'll come out on the other side. I do want to say one thing about April 20th, the day that she woke. That was a gift from Stephen. April 20th was Stephen's birthday. And I truly believe that uh, he sent her back to us on that day. And um, I spoke earlier about community. Um, it was that point on that people really stepped it up a notch. It was crazy, <laughs> the stuff. Nate Tony, I know that you were on this line and I know you all have heard his name before. He started a campaign, Hello Darling, and Party People campaign, where he drew a picture of her and obviously half of you got this on. You, Rhonda, you're wearing it right now. I can see your 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 t-shirt and everything. I mean, that to me was was it crazy for you to? Can, can you imagine you wake up and like I I finally I, I didn't get my phone for a few weeks because I couldn't find it, but I finally got it, and I'm looking through Facebook and there's all of these pictures in this t-shirt with my face on it and they're like going like this yeah and then there's like wine glasses being sold and <laughs> mugs being sold and I'm like it was all for the scholarship and I was just like oh my god and then it Jen Wallace's niece is Elizabeth Banks the beautiful actress and she got Elizabeth Banks to post on her Facebook and Instagram with the shirt and um my friend Brianna made beautiful bracelets and sold them for the scholarship and my friend Tori made like these necklaces oh, and the yeah. that were just beautiful. It was so bizarre, you know. Um, Community was just so giving. Yeah, I mean, it was crazy. And then the Cabot posted on their marquee, um, mm -hmm. "Welcome home, Karen." You know, when I came home, and it was um, the show because Bob Levine the whole time kept posting <laughs> on Facebook, "The show must go on," and then it was like, "The show will go on." And so they had that up on the marquee. And honestly, Bob Levine, I'm going to tell you right now, one of the first questions I asked her was, "Who the hell is Bob Levine? <laughs> this guy's all over this. I'm digging him. I had no idea who you were, Bob, and I love you." <laughs> Karen, after you woke up, you spent a few more days in ICU, and then you were moved to the COVID. Bless you, Lila. That's my daughter. Sorry if everyone heard her. <laughs> <laughs> um, you were moved to the COVID wing at Leahy. Could you please share with us your experience in those days? Yeah, I'll have Sandy start, and then I'll jump into the part where, that I remember. So in the ICU, I uh, would receive updates. And um, one of the first updates I got when she, when she woke up was her PA called and he was outside of her room and he kept calling her Karen under glass, Karen behind the glass, Karen. And it was just because she was in her private room. It was just so sweet how he's talking about her. And as he's talking to me, he goes, wait a minute, hold on. He said, I'm telling you right now, she's winking at me. She's nodding, she's waving, she's giving me the thumbs up. He said, but I have to tell you about a story. He said, all of this time, <clears throat> we, when she was under or everybody, when they're under, when they're coming out of it, every time we go in the room and we talk to them because we know their family is not sitting there with them. And we talk, hey, Karen, how you doing? And we touch their hand and, and, and they, we want to make sure that they know that we're there. And he said, so I went in Karen's room because, you know, I wasn't expecting an answer. And uh, I, I said, hey, Karen, how you doing? And uh, Karen- I do remember this one piece I said to him, I feel like shit and don't even think about bringing me a mirror right now. <laughs> he, said, he said he froze. He said he didn't know what to do with it. He just chuckled and walked out of the room. He said, all right, no mirror. He said nobody had responded like that. So he, 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 absolute, he absolutely loved it. But he I'll stunned. tell you what I remember about that 
the, the room after ICU is, I mean, can you imagine you're this sick and the isolation that you feel? I mean, thank God I didn't remember any of the ICU piece, but I, I spent another week in Leahy and I was basically paralyzed. They gave me a paralytic and then I, I couldn't move. Like I literally could not roll over in the bed. It took two people to push me over. And I was like at, in this huge room at the end of a hallway that had two entrances. One I think kind of went to their floor kitchen and one went to the hallway and it was always dark in there. I didn't even know that I had a window till they finally opened it right before I left. And I would call in the middle of the night, I would hit my button and I would say, could I have ice? Could I have water? Can I have a boost? Cause you know, you would slide down on the bed. My feet were always hanging off the bed just because I wanted to see another human being. I was, and this is before, I think before I even talked to you. Yeah, it was before. It was the week and, that you woke up. Yeah, yeah, and I I was just like, what is going on? In, like, that, can you imagine being in the hospital and being that sick and not having your... I usually have 20 people in the room with me when I'm in the hospital. And so that was... The isolation was just unbelievable, um, unbelievably painful and scary. That room was really scary because when I went to Spalding, I was on this floor and I could see out the door and I would say to them, do not close my door. And I could see a lot of activity going by, but in this place, I mean, I was alone so often that it was just, oh, it was horrific. Sandra. Yes. On your Facebook post on April 25th, you referred to your 32 minute conversation with Karen. At that time, you said the conversation was private. Would you elaborate on that now? Yeah. Um... You know, she woke up on a Monday and it was um, the following Saturday that I was able to speak with her. And the whole time I had been talking with the doctors and the PAs and obviously we knew where the conversation was going to go with Karen. And m my thoughts were and their thoughts were I had to tell her that her husband passed away, uh, but I wasn't going to tell her more than once. And so we had to make sure that she was of sound mind and body. She was very delusional. It was, And that's not unusual. She was she was delusional. Um, and so when the doctors and nurses went in and they spoke with her, they asked her very vague questions. They never asked her where she worked. They never asked her where she lived. They never asked her about her family because they didn't want to spark anything with her. Um, and then um, it was a Saturday morning and Karen uh, looked at her nurse and she said to her, where's Sandy? Where's my family? And so the nurse sat with her and I believe they may have called somebody else in the room with her and they told her about the new world that we're living in. Mm -hmm. And so Karen in, in an hour's time had to learn everything that we knew and we were with doing and living for weeks earlier. And so they called me and they told me that she's asking for family, she's asking for you. Um, and they said, we're gonna patch you through to her. And we, we want you to talk to her, but you, first you have to test her. And so I got on the phone with her and I asked her, you know, I said, Karen, this is Sandy. Um, can you tell me what you know? And she told me everything that they told her. And so, and this is four or five hours later. And so she, she did retain what they said. And, um, and so the conversation continued. And um, the first question she asked me um, was, Sandy, can I ask you a question? And I said, yeah. And she said, can you tell me? No, I have to tell you a little bit about that. Every time for two weeks, she would say to me, Sandy, can I ask you a question? And I would say, yes. I was so and she, weird. And she said, can you tell me? Now, most people, when they have it, they're intubated, they, their voices, her voice was beautiful, but it was so soft and lovely and gorgeous. And it, it just, I hung on every word. So she said to me, this is her first question. Sandy, can I ask you a question? This and, is after she told me the world was shut down. Yeah. And I said, yes. She said, can you tell me? Is Chianti still open? <laughs> First thing she said to me, she wanted to know about Rich's Place, Chianti. I said, no, honey, they're closed too, but they're going to reopen again. And so she led the conversation as Karen does. She spoke about her nightmares. Um, she asked me about her mortgage. She asked me about her bills. She told me that she thinks she left a heater on in the house. Um, she told me that in the last week, she designed a house for us to live in together. Um, I was so hypermanic. You have no idea. She, she uh, told me she needed me to buy stairs so she could rehab at my house so she could get into the pool easily because at that time she couldn't walk. This is five, six days awake. Um, she talked to my daughter, Alexandra, for a little while, and she asked about white lions. She wanted, me to, she wanted Alex to look up what white lions meant. And if anybody recalls, just a few days earlier on Facebook, 
I had posted a picture of Karen that we had taken together at the Cape and she was there with two white lions. So that was a little eerie. But I'll tell um, you why later I asked about the white lions. Um, she uh, then told me that she's going to uh, take me to Italy. And I told her I was going to update my passport. And I am holding you to that. I would hold um, <laughs> <laughs> And then sadly, you know, obviously in the middle of the conversation, she asked me who died from this disease, who died. And uh, at that time, I, I told her Stephen had passed. And she said to me, I know I've been with him the whole time. She said to me, KK, you know, I'm never going to lie to you, right? And I said, yes, of course. And she said, I have to tell you, Stephen passed. And I said, I knew that. I said, because he was with me the whole time during those horrific, the month of hallucinations. He was always in the corner, just staring at me peacefully with his beautiful smile. And at one point I saw him with, surrounded by the white lions. And I thought, that's so weird. What is he doing with those white lions? That's why I wanted to know the meaning of it. And it has a great meaning. I've, I've forgotten what it is now. But it, it's interesting that I asked all these questions. I never said to her, I never asked about Stephen. When I woke up, I said, Where's my, where are my sisters? You know, Because I already knew, and I should say, this was so horrible. When I was delusional in Winchester, on Friday night, I called his sister, Doreen, and told her that Stephen passed, and he didn't actually pass until the next Tuesday. But I, I think it was because a doctor from Burlington had called me and said, you know, your husband's very sick. We have to do something, whatever it was they had to do. And I, in my mind thought, I knew he was going to die. I just knew, knew it. And, um, and that, so his poor sister and brother went to sleep that night thinking their brother had passed and found out the next morning he was alive only to then have to relive this nightmare on Tuesday. This is why people should have taken my phone away. Um, but I knew because I, I, I won't go into the details of all the hallucinations and how horrific they were, but Stephen was always there by my side, just with like a little glow around him protecting me. I felt it. Karen, um, to segue into that, just what you talked about, it, when we were talking to you in preparation for this interview, and you shared with Robin and myself a very personal story that happened between, that happened, it was a premonition that you had. It was a very personal story that you shared with us um, about a premonition that you had on your anniversary last year. Would you mind sharing that story with the group? Because I remember just, I mean, we all believe in angels and, you know, the fate or whatever, whatever it is, the spiritual power and yeah. sixth sense that we all have. And I remember Robin and I were just dumbfounded when you told us. So if we appreciate it if you share it with us. Sure. We, uh, we went up for our anniversary to uh, Ocean Point, Maine, which is part of the Booth Bay Harbor region where we got married on September 30th, 2000. And we go up every year for our anniversary. And before we were leaving, uh, what we, we always do is we sit on these two Adirondack chairs that are on this little clip above the ocean. And I had this feeling. It was so strong. I thought, this is our last time here. We're never coming back together as a couple. And I thought I was going to die. I was convinced. And I, it's not like I'm the kind of person who thinks I'm going to die. But in that moment, I said to Stephen, I want to talk to you about something. I said, I know how much you love Booth Bay. And I just want to say, if anything ever happens to me, I want you to promise me you will always come back here and you will hear my voice in the wind and in the waves. And he said to me, you can never die. You can never die before me. He said, Karen, I just, he said, I can't live without you. You're the love of my life. And I said, and I said, let's have one last dance in this, or let's have a dance in the street like we did on our wedding day. And we went into the middle of the street and we danced. And my friend, Nancy Kane from Harvard was with us because we actually toured Rachel Carson's house that weekend, which is why she was with us and um, who wrote Silent Spring. And she took pictures of us recreating that moment. And it was so weird. I knew in my gut, never thinking in a million years, it would be Stephen to go first. You know, his dad died that week of COVID at 99. And, and that was the other thing Sandy had to say to me that day. She said, you know, Stephen has passed and Skipper and Don Kelly. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me, you know? And, um, but I knew in my heart, but in his mom died even with Alzheimer's in her early nineties. And I thought, this guy is going to be around forever. You know, me with all the surgeries I've had and organs I've lost, I thought I'm a goner, you know? And so it was just so weird that it happened the way it did. Just incredible. Yeah. It was just a riveting story. Thank you for sharing that with us. On April 30th, after 45 days in the hospital, Sandra, you received a call that Karen was moving out of, um, 
was moving to Spalding Rehab in Cambridge. Can I ask you both, what was that transfer experience like? That was a great day. Um, <laughs> I was actually sitting right here at this table because everybody was working from home. I was on a conference call with our operations team and my phone lit up. It was early in the morning and they said, um, Karen is being moved to Spalding. Uh, which we're just so grateful for. There are many, many great rehab centers, but if you've got to go somewhere, that's the place to go, absolutely. And um, after 45 days, they said that they were going to grant me access uh, to the ambulance bay to see her. And I said, sure, when? And they said, right now. And I said, right now? I clicked off that operations call. <laughs> Let me just tell you, with no warning, <laughs> goodbye. And, uh, Where's and uh, I said, wait a minute, right now, they said, but here's the thing, Spalding's send, sending their ambulance right now. They're about 30 minutes out. I live up in Haverhill. I'm about 32 miles away, a good 45 minutes, 50 minutes. All I want to say is that my co-pilot, my daughter, Alexand Alexandra, went with me. And uh, I'm so sorry to say this. I'm embarrassed to say this, but we did beat the ambulance there. <laughs> so... Uh, we made it in plenty of time. So for me, uh, it was cold out and it was just beautiful out and the doors opened and there they were wheeling her out and it was two minutes and 53 seconds. And I know I could say three minutes, but there's something about that number, two minutes and 53 seconds. She was beautiful. She was just absolutely gorgeous. She looked exhausted, but she was beautiful. And I told her uh, as they were putting her in the ambulance to do the work uh, that we loved her. Uh, she gave me that thumbs up and the peace sign. And it was just the most beautiful, beautiful day. And, and you, well, you me, actually were taping it, right? Yeah, Coming I out. was filming. I have you guys. And it was, and the whole thing was so weird because they, you know, they bind you in this, on this gurney. And it was you know, actually kind of scary. Um, and then I'm going through the hall and all of these people I first went through my floor and I recognized those faces. And then I went through the ICU floor and all of these people were lined up in the hallway and they were applauding. And this woman said to me, Karen, can I take your picture? And I thought, who are you? Like, what? That, is that even appropriate to ask me that? And then I thought, stop. These people just worked on you for a month. Like they feel this kindred spirit and, and this pride that they saved your life, you know? And I said, sure, of course, you know, and, and I've since, talk about HIPAA, there is no such thing as HIPAA anymore, because I've had no fewer <laughs> than three people who know people that worked there who have said, oh, I was following her case. My wife came home every night and told me about it. And they would like you to come and speak to them when you're strong enough. The, IC, the Leahy ICU would love for you to come and speak to them because it was such an incredible story for everyone because I was such a goner, you know? And well, I think it, you should, I think you were hope for them yeah. I mean, without a doubt. Yeah, because the mean, people were obviously dying every day and by my side, you know? So, um, so in, we're going to talk a little bit more about Smalding, right? Next, because I'll tell you about my experience there. Um, I was there for three weeks. When I got there, I couldn't move. I couldn't roll over on bed by myself. I couldn't stand. I could barely feed myself. And within a week, I went, I was able to stand up and then I was walking a few steps and then I was walking to the door and then I was, you know, finally able to walk to the bathroom or to a commode probably first and then to the bathroom. And I will tell you those PT and OT people, I would say to them, you are the people I fear the most, but you're the people I need the most mm -hmm. because they work you so hard. And and I would never say no to them, no matter what they wanted, I would do it. And, um, and, you know, again, with the isolation, they would come in and they would check on me and they would say, you know, how are you doing? I mean, people were really freaked out by me because they knew I had just lost my, it's all in your records. They knew I lost my husband, my father-in-law and my friend. And, and I would say to them, I don't want you to think I'm in denial. I know what I'm going to be going home to, but I cannot right now think about be, not being able to walk, having to learn to walk all over again and think about my husband not being there when I get out of here. And so I had to stuff that for three weeks and it was torture, but I was just like, I put it aside and, um, and I said to them, trust me, when I get out of here, I will grieve in the comfort and safety of my family. And then I will get a grief counselor, which I did. The amazing Susan Cooper from New Report has been a godsend to me. And I, I specifically wanted a grief counselor because the things that go through your mind are the what ifs, the what ifs will kill you. What if I hadn't done this? What if I had gone earlier? What if I, you know, whatever. And I wanted someone who has heard that a million times over and over by working with patients who are go, have gone through grief. 
and uh, she's been a godsend to me. Um, you know, and now you're seeing, you, I'm sorry, Karen, did you want to say no, something else? No. no. You know, because now, obviously, um, I don't think the the public, the country really saw inside, you know, the hospital room or the, the PT and the OT, if you will. They're now, obviously, they're now showing that on the news, people's experience and what that looks like in the most severe cases. And it's, it, it's, it's um, yeah. <laughs> well, least, my, my saving, honestly, my saving grace was one of the OT gals who was a, um, they, they knew that I needed special care just psychologically because I had so much to deal with. And she came in and she taught me yoga and she taught me breathing exercises because I wasn't, I didn't sleep for forever, like weeks. And, and she taught me this great breathing exercise so I could make myself go to sleep. She taught me, she did Reiki on me. She would, when she wasn't even at work, she would do Reiki from afar or she would call me on my phone. And she was like an angel, this gal. And, and all of them were like, I want to hug you. You know, when I left, it was so, such... This, the care at Spalding was just amazing. When you were finally released to Sandra's care on May 21st, what was that like? What did that, what was that feeling of freedom like? Well, I mean, you, you start with how you came in. Well, <clears throat> you know, it's, uh, they were so very kind. They allowed me to park right up in front and so we could wheel her right in. And I remember getting out of the car and again, my partner in crime, my daughter, Alex was with me. And uh, I, for a moment, I, I couldn't even walk in there. I, it, it was, it was joy. It, I was scared. I was, I didn't know what. So it was so cute. I, I, not cute, but I walked out just to catch my breath for a moment. And there's a whole bunch of women standing there, by the way. They're all just, I'm like, what are all these employees doing? <laughs> and I didn't know what was happening. And I, I just, I just had to catch my breath. And I looked up, and there she was in the window. And I think I posted a picture of it. It was just absolutely the cutest thing like, I've ever seen. She's up in the window waving. I knew everything was going to be okay. And as I was walking in and they're like, are you Karen's sister? And I'm like, yes. And it was all of those PT and OT people. They're all, they were all there waiting for her to leave. And yeah, they was, just, they it, line the walls. It it's was extraordinary. It was beautiful. It was just a moment I will never forget. Yeah. And for me, it's like you're, you're in the safety of Spalding and you know how high the bed is and how high the seats are. Cause I would get stuck in seats. I, I would have to get lifted out because my legs just wouldn't. The thing that goes on you when you're in bed for two months like that is it's your hip muscles. So then you can't, you can't get up. You can't, uh, you can't walk. And I'm, I'm still suffering from it. It's not a hundred percent. Um, but I would call Sandy every day and say, I want you to measure the toilet height. I want you to measure the chair height. I want you to measure the bed height because it's when you, it takes two guys to lift you, you know, it's, you don't want to get stuck like that. It's so scary. And then I would do the same thing with the PT people. Can you go get a ruler? How tall is the toilet here? How tall is the bed here? When I'm doing this, how tall is that bench that I have to get off of? I still, today I got into an Adirondack chair for the first time and I went, oh my God. I haven't sat in this chair. Can I, am I going to be able to get out of this chair? But I'm, I'm, so, I'm stronger now than I went in the hospital. And I'm actually on less medication than when I went in the hospital. I'm off blood pressure medication. I've lost 68 pounds. You know, when you're in the hospital and you're that overweight, it's, it's hard enough recuperating if you're skinny. And then you're that heavy and it's humbling, you know. And I just said, I can't do this to the medical professionals again. I've got to take this weight off. And so I, I started eating really healthfully in the, rest, in the restaurant, in the um <laughs> In the, uh, at, at Spalding and I, you know, I wouldn't have like, you know, the pot roast, I would get something very clean, the fish with just lemon or whatever. And I just continue to do that here. So, you know, I'm just gonna keep on keeping on and try to get stronger every day. See, those are all the little things. Nobody thinks about the, the height of the toilet seat and how oh, important oh, that is. For granted. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, right? So yeah. I understand that there was a, a, a there was a parade. <laughs> 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 so th this was a surprise for me and Sandy has to tell me obviously at the very end because she didn't want me to be mortified or, or like you know I would did I even want to see people so I think Nate right Nate planned this so uh, listen I got I we should first apologize to the people that we didn't get to have so I sent a text to Nate early on and I said we got to have a parade he sends it back I believe the words were I'm on it and that's the only <laughs> thing I had to do with it he was extraordinary him and heather i mean they were incredible 
So I, I, you know, the reason was we just wanted to lift our spirits. Um, you know, I, we were thinking just immediate family, very close friends. We're thinking some work friends. You know, twenty five cars, maybe forty cars. We're not putting the word out. Anybody, Nate was God bless him. Anybody who put anything out on Facebook, he was all over it, and he shut <laughs> them right down. So, you know, take it off. Um, so it, it did not post. So you know, Nate and I think Matthew was helping out too. Uh, and Heather, Kirsten, they, they, Kirsten, Heather. They, they took charge of it. Uh, it, it turned out to be 120 cars, yeah. at least, over and 200 people until the police. Started. So the poor police. <laughs> what well, we had called someone at the police department, and and they were like, "Well, we can't send anybody that day, but you'll be fine." They didn't know how big it was going to be. So this poor female police officer shows up, and in the the stadium at the end of the street here, the cars are lined like they're at Nordstrom Music Theater for a matinee, right? A sold out matinee. And, and Heather and, and all the kids, they have like the orange vests on and they've got the walkies. And so the cop is like, what is going on? And Nate is like, well, th this was approved by somebody at the police department. She's like, who? Oh, I need a name. He goes, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And she's like, we can't have this. And he says, look, this woman just lost her husband and she's been in the hospital for 65 days. You can either be a part of the problem or you can get on board with us. And she's, she's like, did you actually just say that to me, young man? And then over the walkie-talkie, Matthew Bakuda. Because they had walkie-talkies, that's how big it was. <laughs> over the, over the walkie-talkie, Matthew Bakuda says, four more cars for the second lot. And she goes, the second lot? Where's the second lot? <laughs> and she goes, move this now. And so it ended up starting 10 minutes early. Some people kind of missed it or came late. Um, but it was spectacular. I, I stood for the whole thing and they were, people were shocked that I stood, but I thought, my God, people drove from all over New England to come to it. And I, I thanked them and I, I apologized to the people who, I mean, our poor ushers, Jackie had sent out a note to the ushers and then she had to uninvite them. She's like, they're over the limit. There's no more parking spots. And uh, so I apologized to anybody who didn't come and Bill said, don't worry about it. He goes, we got a parking lot. We can put as many people in it as we want. If you want another parade, we'll have a parade. <laughs> I don't need another parade. I mean, it's just amazing. It's, inc it's incredible. It's just, I mean, it's just, it's, let me just say this. Aren't you glad you're seeing it, right? Aren't you glad you're feeling it? It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. You, 20 weeks from the onset of this personal pandemic nightmare, you were finally able just last Saturday to lay uh, Stephen and your father-in-law Earl to rest. Um, what was it like to plan a funeral service during COVID? A lot of people have had to deal with this. This it's is awful. not easy. It's awful. You know, that's why I'm going to have a huge memorial for them in, in the spring at the theater and with music and food and drinks and just the way we lived our lives. But, you know, in Linfield, uh, up until a couple of weeks ago, you could only have 10 people at the cemetery. I mean, that would have been like, this the siblings and their spouses and then it went up to 25 and our immediate family without great nieces and nephews is 32 so we went with that we were over the limit we didn't care but we had the most i actually feel so badly that more people weren't there because we had the most spectacular celebration of them because nancy rotman our pastor at the center congregational church in linfield knew stephen and earl intimately like stephen was on the lights out committee and earl has been you know a member there for 90 years and she gave the most beautiful eulogy you know how it is so often you go to these and they don't even know the person but she knew them really well and spoke about light and photography and tied it all in and she had had lunch with skipper at um the 99 and he told her about, you know, the night he spent during World War II on the, he, the Vincennes sunk and they were in shark infested waters and she knew that whole story about him. And then Sandra, of course, gave, I, I couldn't speak. I just, I was too nervous about losing it. So Sandra spoke on my behalf and gave an incredible eulogy and thank you to Stephen's family. And then Glenn, his brother, so eloquent, he spoke. And then we went to the cemetery and we had, um, and, uh, and all of my friends just held, held us in their hands that day. Like they all meditated and prayed for us. And we went to the cemetery. It was beautiful out. And our grave is on a hill. And we pulled up and there were, the bagpiper was at the top of the hill playing uh, Scotland the Brave. That's what we got out of our cars too. And then we had a full military burial for Skipper because, and they weren't, they're not doing them now. And our minister said, there is no way this man is not having a full military burial. Ariel, and she got, I think one of the, the, the sailors was from the Constitution, which I loved. And they, he played taps so beautifully on the bugle. We actually thought, people were like, was that a recording? It was so perfect. Oh, perfect. 
and then uh, we did the flag folding and all and and it was really gorgeous a, a friend of um a friend of mine from the theater had me up to her house the day before to get dahlias because I didn't plant my dahlia bed this year because I haven't been home. And so she gave me a huge basket of dahlias and we had them at the grave site. And then because we have babies on our side and they have babies on Stephen's side, we had Doreen and took everyone to her house and Sandy took my family to our house. And that was so hard not to be with all of them. And, you know, in, in true Stephen spirit, I hired a six piece brass band to perform across the pool from us. We had all social distancing. We were on one side of the pool, they were on the other. Jay Daly, God love him, and Jason sang so beautifully. And they did a special arrangement of Smile for me, that Charlie Chaplin song, Smile Though Your Heart Is Aching, that one. And they did a beautiful arrangement. And they played songs that we sang in our childhood and we all, all four sisters sang together. And um, it was just a beautiful day. Like we had company till mid, you know, 11 o'clock. And then my sisters and I laid on the bed till about midnight and I was exhausted, but I, I dreaded it so much, but I, it was actually, I was so at peace because it was so beautifully done. And I just feel lucky we were able to do it. And I feel so sad that our friends weren't there to witness how beautiful it was. And I invited um, Reverend uh, Rotman to uh, speak at Stephen's memorial in the spring because she's so eloquent. Karen, when do you see yourself going home? My goal is, I mean, nothing is carved in stone. I'd like to be home around Labor Day so that I can have four weeks, um, at four months rather, in the house before I hopefully go back to work. And um, I mean, I've been recovering here for what, 10 weeks now. Um, and um, we, our house is a disaster right now. Stephen was a contractor. We had the sunroom gutted. We had the dining room gutted. We had a bathroom on the first floor gutted, which I really need now. We didn't have one. And so there's a lot of work to be done, never mind the fact that it's been four months full of dust because no one's been there. But this weekend, you want to talk about my coworkers and Nate um, led the charge on this. They had an extreme makeover of my sunroom and they finished Stephen's work. And I came Sunday, I've been banned from my house for a couple weeks and I came Sunday and what they created, Heather and Ricky and Matthew and Matthew and Kirsten and who else was there? I don't know because I wasn't allowed. Nate's parents. Nate's parents, oh my God, Lori and Dan. I mean, they guided the electricians, they guided, they, they did this beautiful white beadboard like classic tongue and groove beadboard. Uh, sunroom for me that looks like a restaurant in Maine. It is so stunning and so personal and Nate made all these signs of the, our favorite spots in Maine on wood that was in the basement that was Stevens. He mounted this hammer because Stephen had built the sunroom, you know, the guts of it. And he mounted his hammer on the wall and it looks like a piece of art. It's so cool. And um, I'll share pictures with you guys someday, but it'll, it'll be on Facebook. But um, that's the extreme level that people have gone to for me. So I could have, and we call it now the Ocean Point Oasis because Ocean Point is where our heart and soul lives. And so... I, we're gonna finish the dining room before I go home so that I'm not dealing with dust. Like at the, the day of the funeral, we had the grill going and the tiki torches and I, I definitely felt it yesterday. My lungs are definitely a little sensitive. Um, and so we wanna be careful that I don't get sick from being in the house under construction. But my goal is around Labor Day. I just wanted to interject two questions while you're talking and things that we, that we sort of talked about the other day. Um, and first of all, I believe it was yesterday was uh, National Sisters Day. Yes. Um, and we talked a little bit about your bond as sisters. And can you just tell us a little bit about that? I was explaining, I was getting a little personal with you guys about my relationship with my sister. Yeah. Um, and how, how did, who was responsible for this? Who was responsible for this incredible bond um, that you have? Because not everybody has it. Right. Our I mean, parents. <laughs> our parents, I guess, instilled it. But the four sisters were always close because we always performed as kids. It was like, if you ever want to send me into therapy, just go like, line up, girls, line up. <laughs> My dad would like drag us out of bed at 11. He was like the, uh, the Frank Sinatra of Springfield. And he was the number one wedding band there. And 11 o'clock at night, he'd call my mother, Eva, get the girls, throw them in the car. They want to see him. And we didn't have to go perform. 
So we were very close. I mean, we fought like cats and dogs, like any kids oh, would, yeah. but we were very close. And Sandy and I are only about a year and a half apart. So we always had like this sixth sense with each other. She could be in, living in Texas and I'd be like, what's wrong? What's going on with you right now? I do the same thing with Anna. Um, our sister, I'll be like, I have a feeling Anna's in the hospital and we'll call my niece. Is, is Anna in the hospital and you're not telling us? You know, and our little baby Gina. So we've always been very, very close, but I, we have an, a special, a special sixth sense about us. And you can imagine, I mean, we're four strong personalities. <laughs> when we love each other, so we love each other. <laughs> when there's one of these, the state's not big enough for us. <laughs> but that's what's so awesome about it is that because you're so, you, you would think that because you have such strong personalities, you'd actually clash. But yeah. it, we do. Case, I mean, we're works like anybody do. But, but we're, you we're know, the so other question I wanted love. to ask you because, yes. yep. No, go ahead. I'm good. No, it's okay. This is your show. This is your floor. Um, I just, I wanted to ask you, we talked, we talked about, you know, you just sort of touched on it a little bit the other day about how should people like, almost like a pregnant woman, some people don't want people touching them. Some people don't mind and they love it. How should people <laughs> approach you once you uh, so get out there? Let me there? answer that one for her. <laughs> We're going to create right? a new first. <laughs> it's going to say, hello, darling, stay back. Yeah. Um, no, I literally <laughs> want a show that says, hello, darling, don't touch me. <laughs> I mean, look, every single person has said, I can't wait to give you a big hug. I'm like, do not touch me. Um, I am, you know, my parting words when I got released from the home nurse the other day, she said to me, Oh, you know, I just want to let you know, you can, we're finding that people can, can get COVID a second time. And I was like, shoot me now. I cannot go through this again. Like that put the fear of God back in me. And I mean, we're very careful. We've all been quarantined. All of our family that was here, we've all been very quarantined. Um, but you know, it's like, I want to go, I'm thinking about going to the, the Amy Winehouse, give me live thing at Manchester Athletic Club. Cause I had tickets for it. And you know, I would be outside, but I said, I don't want anyone coming up to me right now because people just go in for the hug. I'm like, don't touch me. Like, I don't know who you've been with. You know, you can't trust it. You know, and people say they're quarantining and then you see everybody on Facebook with their arms around each other, you know? So I have to be super careful. I mean, I'm not a hundred percent yet. Yeah. Um, which is something you should talk about. I and mean, they probably want to know how you're yeah, doing. I mean, I'm doing, you know, as, as I'm, every doctor has said, I'm a walking miracle. Like the fact that I survived this is truly a walking miracle. And I truly believe it is because hundreds of thousands of people around the world were praying for me. Like our, our Beato, our cousin who's enshrined in Italy, that whole, you know, place was, was praying for us. I, I will tell you, I mean, Safafia, the mayor of Gloucester had, 2,500 prayer group on the on Cape Cod, never mind her people in Gloucester. And at one point, this is an amazing story. I knew I was dying. I was slipping away in when I was in ICU and I felt myself going. And Safadia's big arm came up like this to me in my dream. And she grabbed me and pulled me back. And, you know, I texted her when I woke up and I said, you saved my life at one point. And I said, I was having this dream. It was almost like you were there. And she was like, not like I was there. I was there, you know, Sabathia. <laughs> and that woman is divinity. She has divinity in her. I felt her pull me back. It was amazing. So I'm walking, I walk with a cane outside. I don't use it in the house. Um, Cause I still, they, they, you know, with odd surfaces and stuff, they want me to be careful. I fell once since I've been home and it was because I got overconfident. It was just down the three steps to my bedroom and I wasn't paying attention. And I was thinking, oh, I'm fine, you know, and I, I did fall and I was a little bit sore, but thank God I didn't crack my head open on the bed and I didn't break a hip. Um, so I, it, but that happened early on and it was good, a good wake up call for me. But, you know, when you're recuperating at home, you think you're fine until you go and you have a big day at a funeral, followed by a cemetery, followed by people at your house till midnight. And I was, I'm wiped, you know. Um, even just like the thought of going back to work, taking a shower, get in the car, and, you know, all of that. It's going to be a while before I'm strong enough to do that. So, you know, if you see me, please do not touch me. Um, like we shouldn't be touching anybody really right now. And it's so difficult. It's like Rich says it all the time from Chianti. How can I open my restaurant right now when I can't hug everybody coming through the door? You know, he says, I have to wait until it's safer for my employees. And um, so it is, it's nerve wracking. And 
even at the funeral, even though both sides of our family were very quarantined, we still kind of went, are you guys hugging or you're not hugging? And the Purell is this one, the Purell, you know, we would get the Dunkin' Donuts cups, we wipe them down with a sanitizing thing, and then we Purell and you can't be too careful. Karen, how has this experience, I mean, how has this experience changed you? I mean, sometimes, you know, you say, oh, we'll just go back to the old way that we lived, but really how? I mean, I couldn't, go, I couldn't without Stephen go back to the old way I lived because he was such a rudder to me. He did everything for me. Like you can't work the hours I worked without somebody picking up all the pieces at home and driving me from theater to theater. And so I could sleep in the car, you know, you know, basically what I know, and I said this when I woke up, tomorrow is promised to no one. Um, I knew that I was blessed, but I never dreamed in my wildest dreams, knew the depth of support, the extent of support that I've found since I've woken up. And, you know, but honestly, I can say that, I don't want to say that I don't have any regrets. It's not about regrets about getting exposed to COVID. I wish I didn't get exposed to COVID, but in my love with Steven, I have no regrets because we lived life so fully. And I, that's something I would share with everyone, like in your partnerships and your, with your children, with your husband, your wife, your spouse, your friends, just live every day. You know, Stephen and I were the kind of couple who every single night for almost 30 years, when we had dinner, it wouldn't matter if I got McDonald's takeout, which I never have done <laughs> to bring home to him, God forbid, if he had, didn't have like a beautiful steak and a fine dinner. But we had, no matter what we got, it was on china with cloth napkins and a proper silverware setting, uh, setting and, a, and a candle lit. Every night of our marriage forever, we did that. I don't own a paper product in my house other than paper towels. You know, so we had a very rich, beautiful life together. And, you know, and I, I think the other thing is you're, you're stronger than you know. Reverend Nancy at the funeral said to us, you know, because Stephen lost another brother years ago, a hit and run in San Diego. And she said, you lost Craig and you're still here. You got through it. And, you know, you lost Edie, his mom, a couple of years ago. We didn't think we'd get, get through that. And we did. It's like the human, the ability of humans to wake up every day. It's just so cellular that you've got to move forward. And I mean, my life is never going to be the same. I mean, but what I can say is I had a great love and I can't tell you how many women and men I've said this to, to that I've said, I have known great love. And so many people who have been married three, four times or have been married for 30 years have actually said to me, I'm going to leave my husband. You know what? You're right. Life is short. And that's, this is not a great love. And I want to find that. And, and that's sad to me, but ha I'm happy because I know it and I appreciate it. I know how lucky I was. And, and I love the fact that you had such a, I always love love. And I love the fact that you had such an awesome marriage and partnership and, you know, soulmate. I, I just, it's, it's just, it's all part of what makes this story so incredible. Yeah. And you know, one of the things when I woke up that I was afraid of, I was afraid because Stephen was gone that I wasn't going to have his family anymore. And they were like, what, are you crazy? Like you're our family. We've had, you know, Doreen says you're the sister I never had. And, in, and I think about it and I go, my nieces, like Jesse and Kristen, Brian, they didn't know life before me. I've known them since they were babies. I said to Doreen the other day, we go to her house every Christmas Eve for the seven fishes. And I said, I want you to invite me to seven fishes. And she was like, she burst into tears and she said, oh my God, I never thought you'd come. I didn't think you'd be able to, you know, and I said, she said, and I said to David, my husband, there's going to be three fewer at the table, dad and Steven and Karen. And I, and I said, I have to be there. I have to represent him and all of his cousins who are just so dear to me and my nieces and nephews. I can't, I'm so happy that they've embraced me because I love them dearly. Sandra, I have to ask you too, how has this experience changed you? Um, I, well, um, there's a lot of things that I've learned in this experience. Uh, first of all, the power of many, which half of them are probably all of them are right here on this call right now. It's amazing when you gather people together with one mission, uh, you can move mountains. I truly believe that. Um, I really uh, have thought more about one kind word, one kind uh, comment, one kind notification, one kind anything. Uh, written or said, it got me through my days. Uh, you know, Karen's friend, Robin, when we lost Stephen, but we're still hoping for Karen, she had sent something to me that says, as we mourn, we hope. And it was just enough to get me through my day. Um, 
my nephew Jody Easter weekend, you know, I told him what was happening and he said, look at it like a slingshot. He said, auntie, sometimes you have to go back in order to launch forward. I right. could just tell you dozens and dozens, a little girl named Bella, she wrote this beautiful thing. It's, it's called came and Bella Paris. Oh my God. I mean that, that, I think I looked at that picture a hundred times. There are so many little things that people did to help my family get through this. I will, I, I, I hope that I can be that for somebody else. Um, I have learned to ask the questions and do the research as my sister Anne Marie always says, do the Google. And I did and, and do the same. If you have somebody in the hospital, understand what's happening to them. Mm. Um, celebrate every win I learned, you, you know, it didn't matter how big or small we, we hold, we held on to those. That was our hope. And, and then just be in the here and now, uh, because the what ifs will tear you apart. Just be in the here and now and be in the moment because, uh, that will get you through. Do you have any closing thoughts, either of you? Um, I want to go first. Yeah, you go first. Um, so many lives have been lost to COVID. Uh, Stephen was an absolutely beautiful soul. Uh, he was a kind man, a humble man. Uh, he was a healthy man, 58 years old. Um, we lost him. I almost lost my best friend. Uh, and I Debbie Meek. <laughs> And Gina, Indiana. Uh, uh, but it's not over. I, I beg people, please wear your masks. I beg you to please stay six feet apart. I beg you to wash your hands. And what I learned from this is I beg you to please, if you can, donate blood. It's going to save somebody's life. I thank you, Leslie and Robin, for having us tonight. You're so very kind uh, to do this. I, I thank everyone for doing all that you did to bring Karen home because I do believe, in addition to those incredible teams at Leahy and Winchester. It was the power of many that brought her here. So thank you for listening tonight and thank you for being part of it. Yeah. And I would just say, you know, wear your masks. Obviously that's number one. You do not want to have to have your niece make you a mask for your husband's funeral with his initials on it. I love this. I treasure it. And I hope you never have to have one made, you know, wash your hands, social distance, don't get comfortable. There is no doubt in my mind we're going to have a second wave. And if you don't think I'm going to be nervous about that, you know, being more susceptible. Um, and most of all, be kind. Just be kind. There's, the, you know what the funeral director said to us the other day? In the past month, people are cutting off the funeral procession more than he's ever seen in all of his years in the business because they just don't have patience. They don't care. And, and there's been so many. Yeah, and there's been so many. Yeah, true. I didn't even think yeah. about that. Um, so that's it. Just thank you to everyone. I felt all of your love and support and the cards, the postcards, the, the flowers, the gift baskets. I mean, you have lifted me and my family up and I can't wait to be back with everyone again in the future. We've gone well over an hour, which was, we sort of expected it. We had talked about that. Are you up to answer a few questions if people want to put a few in the chat? Sure. Are you good? Because I don't want to. I don't want to exhaust you either. I'm. I want to respect that. But I know we talked about it. Is that yeah, okay? I mean, if anyone has anything, you know, I mean, I think we've covered probably most of the stuff. But if there's a burning okay. question, let me give it a second. I tell you what. Why don't I just read off? Why don't I just thank our sponsors one more time, if that's okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, of the women in. Uh, of on the chat. Yeah, what? And and Robin's going to do the chat. Yes, thank you, Robin. Robin's rocking, Robin, my supreme allied commander. And thank you, Sandra and Karen. You are both incredible, incredible, powerful women. And I am very grateful to know you. And thank you for doing this for us tonight. My pleasure. Our, our sponsors for the Power of Women um, series, which we've been running all year round and been doing more events than we actually ever thought we would because of COVID. Uh, our gold sponsor is Eastern Bank, our silver sponsors are Brookline Bank, Robin Martin at Churchill Properties, Constitution Financial Partners, Jill Michaud uh, from uh, Gibson Sotheby International Re Realty. Those are our silver sponsors. And um, our bronze sponsor is Beverly Bootstraps, the thrift store, and Estelle Rand, Beverly Ward II City Councilor. Um, tonight's event sponsors, specifically again for Karen, uh, they were silver sponsors. Uh, Anthony and Dodge Certified Public Accountants, Keller Williams Realty Team, Sarah McBurney Laporto, and Linda Turcott. 
and Temkin Financial Group, LLC. We also had uh, bronze event sponsors for this evening, uh, Super Sub Casual Catering, and Russell Center for Chiropractic. So we are very, very grateful. Did we get any questions while I was doing No that? questions, but a whole lot of love. <laughs> a whole lot of love. And you know what? Sometimes that's all that yeah. matters. So grateful for everyone who came out tonight. Uh, Robin and I, um, this came out of an idea that Robin, Robin talked about it to think she'd be ready to talk. And we are very, very grateful, Karen and Sandra, that you chose the Greater Beverly Chamber and chose us as thank people you. that you wanted to talk to about it and all your friends and family. So thank you. Let's this see the hearts before we go. Let's see the hearts. Let's spread do it. The love. Spread the love, people. I love it. <laughs> Thank you all for indulging us and listening to our story. It was, oh, uh, I, it was we yeah. all wanted to hear it. Uh, I, I, we lived every night, I, I said to you, so there were nights I couldn't go to bed until I waited until I saw Sandra's update. Mm. And I think a lot of people were like that. So, you know, yeah. it's just so good to hear all, you know, everything that you went through. And you look fabulous, by the it way. Awesome. Thank you. I even put makeup on for you guys today. <laughs> I think you like actually place. got dressed for the first time. Are you kidding me? We've been living in leisure with, right? It's crazy. Put makeup on. I'm so grateful. Okay, so this is to be continued, obviously. This is not, this is, this is, we're going to, we're going to, the show must go on. We are moving forward, right? Straight ahead. So again, thank you. Good night, everyone. Really appreciate your time tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, Robin Foster, Assistant Director for the Greater Beverly Chamber of Commerce. Leslie Gould, Executive Director, Greater Beverly Chamber of Commerce. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Much love, everyone.